Kate and Lunch Talk, uh, hosted by the Institute for Policy and Civic Engagement. I'm Norma Ramos, I'm the Associate Director here at ICSI, and I'm excited to have this opportunity for us to be back together in our space. Um, just want to give you a quick background about uh, the Civic Engagement Lunch Talk. We're excited to host our awardee, um, who will share his, his research with us. Uh, the Civic Engagement Research Awards are actually uh, a way for ICSI to support research from UIC faculty that centers on concepts and practices and methods of civic engagement. So we're super excited about hosting our awardee from last year to share his research with us. A few housekeeping pieces before we get started. Um, we will host a presentation and then afterwards we'll open up for Q&A for about 10-15 minutes and then um, we have lunch boxes here that you can actually feel free to share or take them to go um, so you can feel free to eat them later or when you wrap up and take them with you as well. Um, the restrooms are right along down the hall that are located to your left side. Um, there is a sign-in sheet. It would be great if you all can sign in before or after you leave. That would be awesome. Um, and we are recording the actual presentation session actually. Um, and then we will start recording for the Q&A. We'll host it on our YouTube page as well. So if anybody has any questions, let me know. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick introduction, but I'm excited to um, share with you the Civic Engagement as Computer, uh, computer Scientist. These masks. <laughs> Ooh, these masks. Um, for our Civic Engagement Launch Talk presented by UIC Associate Professor of Computer Science, Dr. Chris uh, Kadich. Dr. Chris Kanish is an associate professor of computer science at the UIC and it currently serves as the director of undergraduate at studies for computer science and data science here at UIC. He completed his PhD in computer science and engineering at UC San Diego. Yay, we have some Californians at the room. Um, in 2012, and a BS in mathematics and computer science at Purdue University in 2005. He is the recipient of the NSF Career Award along with numerous UIC internal research, teaching, and advising awards. He has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles in the areas of security and privacy, internet measurement, and human-computer interaction with many articles appearing in venues considered the best in the world, including IEEE, Security and Privacy, ACMM, ICMM, ACMM, <laughs> SHI, among others. His general area of expertise is social tech technical cybersecurity, which is super exciting, with a current focus on bringing his data-informed and adversarial aware approach to civic technology spaces, as well as discovering vulnerabilities, developing defenses within modern web and mobile app ecosystems. Um, today's talk will feature findings from a recent project at the intersection of social, technical cybersecurity uh, cyber and privacy. Over the past year, Dr. Keenish participated in the municipal registering process as a data scientist, a software engineering practitioner, and a commissioner at the Chicago Advisory Administration Commission. This talk will provide an overview of his experience in multidisciplinary civic engagement and explore potential opportunities for future efforts at the intersection of computer science and civic engagement. I'm super excited and you help me welcome Professor Keenish. Thanks so much, Norma. Thanks everybody for being here today. Definitely a uh, big thanks to Joe, without whom uh, a lot of this work could not have happened the way that it uh, turned out. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out, and I'm here to tell you all about it. So uh, if anybody wants to ask questions during the talk, I, I know that's going to be part of the YouTube video, feel free to either just interject or hold those questions to the end. Totally up to you, but I'm very happy to be interrupted at any uh, point in time. Uh, thanks to Norma, I can go pretty quick through this first uh, this first slide here. Uh, so my, my time at UIC over the past 10 years has been uh, absolutely fantastic, focusing on socio-technical cybersecurity. So I got started on that because one of the most important insights that we had over the course of my PhD was we were looking at the economics of spam. And the key insight that we have there is that there are millions, billions of spam messages sent every single day, but they're not being sent because somebody woke up that day and said, you know what I want to do? I want to get a message into somebody's inbox. Nobody cared about that in and of itself. It was always getting that message into someone's inbox was a means to an end of making money. 
uh, in, in many, many cases. And so focusing on understanding what the human beings that are part of that system uh, are actually interested in, what their goals are, gave us a huge amount of insight that allowed us to come back and come up with robust technical solutions to the problems that we were working on. And so that has kind of driven a lot of the insights that I've been uh, bringing to my research here at UIC. I've been incredibly uh, excited to dive a little bit more into these uh, civic analytics, civic technology spaces where I can bring those insights to uh, very incredibly people-focused uh, and community-focused problems. Uh, so those people-focused and community-focused problems uh, are really, really interesting to me. I, I'm a technologist. I uh, care a lot about the, the cool technologies that I'm teaching to our students here at UIC. Uh, we are doing an amazing job in the computer science department. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, shout out my, my students and all the faculty that, that we have over here just bringing thousands of people through this amazing program. And they're able to uh, really, really express themselves and have self-determination through that education in technology here and not have more debt, all that fantastic stuff. Uh, so having that positive impact is fantastic, but one of the big things that I've learned living here in, uh, in Chicago is that I can focus on our students, I can focus on education and teaching my classes and doing my research, but there's a whole lot going on that uh, exists outside of that, uh, you know, you can call it a bubble, maybe, maybe we're in a bubble, maybe, maybe, maybe right? Uh, and so focusing on that has really helped me understand that there's a lot of problems that, that exist, there's a lot of potential solutions to them, but one thing that I, I have seen a lot of people in the technology space do is kind of start at the implementation. It's like, oh, we have a cool technology. We have this technology, it's awesome, it's fantastic. We're gonna figure out how do we use this technology to solve a problem. So you kind of have a hammer looking for a nail. Uh, and once we figure out what that solution is, we maybe even sell that solution to uh, the federal government, get some uh, grant funding for it as this potential solution. Uh, and then we back up into, oh, there, there we found the correct problem to apply our fantastic new solution to. And then uh, we say, oh, our impact is going to be we found this problem, we found the solution, here's all the people that's going to help. So kind of going from the right side of that slide to the left side of that slide. And so what I've learned by actually coming out of my shell in the College of Engineering is that the right way, in, in my plan, to look at a lot of these problems is to start from the left side of this title and go over to the, go over to the right side. And if we start with being engaged and embedded with the people around us in our community, in our neighborhoods, whatever have you, better understand the problems first, better understand what are the potential solutions then, and only then do we start saying, okay, let's put some uh, implementations, maybe even some technology-infused implementations in there. Then we're going to have a much better opportunity to, uh, to do. So I got involved, I got motivated to work in this space, uh, because I am a resident of the uh, Bridgeport Chinatown area, and the way that the numbers were looking you know, before you know, 2019 or so, 2019, 2020, when it's like, oh, hey, we're going to have the census, we're going to see that, oh, there's probably going to be enough people such that there is maybe going to be enough to draw a Asian majority ward of uh, one of the 50 in the city of Chicago. Uh, and I saw that as, oh, this is something that you know, a lot of folks in our community have been talking a lot about, but trying to understand better. And it piqued my interest, right? There, there's this opportunity, there is uh, a lot of humans, there's a lot of moving pieces and, and bureaucracies and, and messy real world politics surrounding it, but at its core, there is some opportunity to bring uh, a real technological solution to that process. So I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a detour here. Uh, other versions of this talk, I do several slides worth of what is redistricting. But I'm, I'm really excited, especially for you know, people in the room here, in Chicago here, you probably remember that we just went through a somewhat contentious uh, redistricting cycle, both at the city level as well as uh, the state level in Illinois and other states. Uh, and we end up with a map that is supposed to be uh, compact, contiguous, uh, nearly equal population, and not 
uh, diminishing the vote, the ability for minority groups to have their representation in a, a body. And so if we're thinking, okay, after this process of coming up with an apportionment of different, maybe neighborhoods, maybe communities, whatever have you, what we end up with is a compact and contiguous ward map. And so this is what a compact and contiguous ward map ended up looking like for the city of Chicago. This is uh, the last time around. The, the map for now has different ridiculous shaped uh, wards, but nonetheless, uh, it's something that really makes you think, well, what's going on here? And in this uh, diagram, we've got our 77 community areas, which roughly map onto neighborhoods, but not exactly. Uh, in black, and then we've got the colored uh, areas are those wards. They are technically contiguous. They are technically of nearly equal population, but that, that compactness really makes you wonder what the heck is going on here. And so the, the why, what happened here is, of course, that the 50 members of city council are the people who are deciding, hey, how should the war that I am going to run for re-election in look? And what we end up with is a scenario where the older people are choosing their voters rather than the voters being able to ju choose their uh, older people, which is what we would hopefully want in uh, a democratic system. Uh, and so this, you know, it really sticks with me in this uncomfortable way because it's just so ridiculously unfair. And it, I just, for a long time, I was just upset about it and I couldn't really uh, vocalize, I couldn't like, put into words what that frustration was, but I came down to a few really uh, important points here. And so when the older people are choosing their voters rather than the voters choosing the older people, this uh, exacerbates the incumbent advantage that already exists. If you are already in, uh, in power, you're already in all the meetings, you're already meeting all the constituents, you're already making those connections. And a lot of people are going to want to take a safe bet, especially uh, business corporate interests, and they're going to want to keep that same person in there so they can keep getting done whatever it is uh, they get done. And so we have an even steeper incumbent advantage. Uh, when things get split up in these very, very ridiculous ways, individual communities are split into several different wards. And so if I have one community that is centered around, say, I don't know, rinking yards, or some you know, potential gigantic redevelopment effort, but it gets split between two, three, four different wards, those people cannot necessarily rally around a uh, community uh, uh, advocate that could say, no, what this community wants is X. They, they can't do that because that, community, that one specific community has been split among several wards. Uh, likewise, another kind of really big uh, downside to this is that when these individual wards are spanning lots of different communities, there is no focal point to that uh, to any reasonable extent. And what you end up with is a, a situation where, oh, if 10% of the uh, community in this ward comes from here, 10% comes from here, 10% comes from here, 10% comes from here, grassroots community-focused candidates aren't going to have uh, much of a chance against a well-funded candidate. Because when there is no cohesive community, when there is no you know, strong fabric with which to actually discuss these things amongst uh, community members, money talks. It, like, I don't need to have a cohesive community to send out 50,000 mailers. I don't need to have a co cohesive community to get my ads on TV or whatever I need to do. I, and so your money interests end up having a higher, this is my hypothesis, right? The, your, these money interests have a higher chance of actually having their preferences uh, reflected in who gets elected more so than the individual community. I'd love to do some more research along those lines. And so this is bad. This gets me upset. This gets me uh, angry, right? And so uh, thankfully, I was able to connect with a group of folks that were deciding, you know what? We're just going to do this the right way. And so the Chicago Advisory Districting Commission was formed by a nonprofit by the name of Change Illinois. And they said, look, we are going to model good behavior for the city. Uh, if the city is not going to do in public engagement and find out what people want their words to look like, we're going to do it. If the city is not going to do the uh, job of map drawing out in public, we're going to do it. And this was, uh, this was really, really uh, exciting. And so having a high quality map 
ready for uh, city council to potentially consider as part of their process was uh, was very, very important here. Just to A, have it there, because nobody else is going to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. And B, that does give us the opportunity to be part of that conversation. So how does one come up with a uh, high quality ward map that is equitable, legally compliant, and uh, is actually there and ready to go with the, the best thing? So if you want to do that, uh, especially when I'm coming from it as an engineer, as a computer scientist, I say, well, you got to convene a selection committee, you got to solicit applications from throughout the city, you got to select the best people for the job of being a commissioner on this commission, you got to give them enough training so they know what to do because they aren't experts in this field, you got to work with community partners to organize these meetings, you got to drive turnout uh, through community organizers and people so that people actually know that this is happening. Uh, you got to collect that testimony from people in person. You got to collect it from on Zoom. You got to collect it from the web. You want to keep uh, experts in uh, the legal concerns or the map drawing concerns uh, on retainers so that they can provide expert advice. You got to secure the funding that will allow you to even run this thing in the first place. You got to keep the motivation high among these 13 people that are volunteering a substantial amount of their time for this process. And you know, right down here, right down at the end. You also need a high quality technical platform that enables the collaborative mapping process. So I'm kind of very explicitly situating the, the stuff that I'm focusing on, the stuff that I uh, helped out with, in addition to being a member of this commission, right here as, as a sub, 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 sub board. Because if you don't have everything else, if you don't have the non-technical side of this, the, the technical side isn't really gonna help uh, much at all, in my estimation. So uh, one of the other really big takeaways I had from working on this uh, process was that I, I did not come in and say, look, you know, I'm Mr. Technical Guy, I'm Mr. Computer Scientist, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I came in and said, look, I don't want to participate as uh, a consultant. I don't want to participate as somebody who comes in and, and does expert stuff. I want to participate as a community member, as a volunteer, as somebody who has a, a track record of being engaged in my community, listening to my community, and doing my best to speak up for my community. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to fully understand this problem, and so I did apply to be one of the 13 people chosen from throughout the, the city to be part of this uh, process. And uh, I was very, very excited when I was chosen to, to do so. <clears throat> so this really, really drives up. So if there's one slide that I think is the most important part of this talk, it's definitely going to be this one. Uh, what I did as a computer scientist in this, when I'm actually living the idea of doing uh, civic engagement as a computer scientist, I wanted to make sure that I was centering the people. When I do anything in second column, I want to center the people, the communities, the individuals, the outcomes that are going to change people's daily lives more so than centering a, a specific solution. So if you talk about redistricting with a lot of uh, technologists, computer scientists, a reasonable first guess of how to solve the problem is going to be like, oh, can't we just encode people's preferences and run an algorithm and that algorithm can be proven to be fair? It's like, Technically, you may need, you could do that as an effort, but the vast, the, the highest likelihood situation there is that by bringing the algorithm up first, rather than bringing the people up first, you're not going to end up with a, a good outcome. There. And so the idea that I have here is that we want to have the technology that we're using as part of these processes uh, function as a best supporting actor rather than the star of the, the show. And if we do that, if the technologists kind of acknowledge that that's the role that is that the technology is playing, we can say, well, okay, instead of focusing on the technology, we are very explicitly going to engage in this not as a technologist, but as a member of the community, just like anybody else. And if you start from that, if you go in the front door in that way, then you can bring that expertise just as one big part, one supporting actor within the entire effort of making the, the solution actually happen. And this, uh, this diagram I have here I absolutely love uh, is from a fantastic blog post by uh, Suresh Mikhail Subramanian. 
who is uh, somebody who does a lot in the outward and fairness area. But uh, I would highly recommend looking up this, uh, this blog post. I'd be happy to give a, a link to it, where he's, his thesis is really that a computer security approach to this, where we say we're going to identify unfairness. So one of the things that I'm trained to do as part of my you know, computer science research is to say, look, here's a system. How is somebody going to subvert the list of rules that already exist here and uh, cause the system to do something unexpected for their own ends? And so when we're trying to figure out where unfairness is, when we're trying to figure out how to make systems that are technology infused equitable, rather than trying to say, look, I'm going to define fairness in this way, it's very, very useful to say, mm, I'm going to find the unfairness. And finding the unfairness is a process that we go through that, you know, I mean, I'm going to have a job forever because for as long as people are trying to defend technical systems and come up with uh, solutions, just like in our spam example, there's going to be people who say, oh, well, I know how to use technical systems as well, and I don't have the same goals as you, and I am going to try to find a way to break whatever defense it is that you've put up there. So, uh, with all of that in mind, uh, let me actually get to the, uh, the technology stuff that we did. So, this is where we're going to take a really, really hard left turn into all the cool technology stuff. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, technical background. I'm probably going through this a little faster. We have maximum time for, uh, for questions. Uh, what we were able to use as part of this effort was a fantastic, amazing, wonderful, completely open source system called Districtor that was built by the um, metric geometry uh, and gerrymandering group out of Tufts University, uh, led by Moon uh, Dushan, who's an absolutely fantastic uh, researcher in this field uh, at the intersection of mathematics and, uh, and gerrymandering. So they had this. Uh, this tool that they made that's not the most popular one in the room when it comes to a web-based uh, map drawing system, but it has a focus that is very similar to what I was talking about earlier, where we're centering the people and what they're trying to accomplish rather than having the technology drive the system. It's like, look, this is a tool. All tools introduce some form of bias uh, in a way that's uh, inescapable, but this is one where it was intentional to say, look, we're going to minimize the amount of, you know, algorithm forwardness or bias that is introduced by the, the technology that we're using here. Uh, the system itself is just a static web page that has a whole bunch of JavaScript on it uh, that is doing a little bit of uh, talking to a database to store people's drawn maps so that they can share them with, uh, with each other, and it's pulling in data from another service uh, called Mapbox that has access to that where I have uploaded all of the block level census data. Uh, and so, uh, so this uh, static web hosting service, uh, what's really, really fantastic about it is that you know, I, I could serve to anybody on the team or anybody in Chicago that wanted to follow along on their own or draw their own maps. They get 100 gigabytes of download for free. That's a pretty decent amount. Uh, your website would have to be monstrously popular before you go above that 100 gigabytes. And we were able to so store the drawn maps into a database. And we can do that all kind of for free. We had a free database that uh, is stored here that were provided by this uh, company, MongoDB. And that was enough for what we were trying to do. We didn't even use half of the storage over the course of drawing this entire map. Uh, and likewise, we had a fantastic kind of free tier of the mapping service that we were able to, to take advantage of here. Uh, and so the total cost for this mapping application that we used probably for hundreds, maybe low thousands of hours uh, as part of this process, and we were allowing thousands of people to kind of follow along at home, draw their own maps. The whole entire cost for running this entire full application was $14. And it was only $14 instead of $0, because I really wanted a cool sounding domain name. And so we picked wordmap.app. I really like that one. And so I was like, you know what, that's worth the $14. But besides that, we got this entire you know, technical side of the project done for uh, that amount of money. Uh, now, you know, there, there's a whole lot of you know, pro bono work, pro bono work in there of, of me building things on, on the back end. So if somebody had a great idea but didn't necessarily have their expertise, 
it's not going to cost fourteen dollars. But uh, I let, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. It's something that my my advisor taught me way back when. Uh, so uh, not only did we use this open source distributor software, what was fantastic about it was that it was fully open source and well documented and well architected. And so I was able to make a significant number of updates and improvements based on what was specifically happening for us, the 13 commissioners, at any moment in time. And so the agility that we have in terms of bringing in the best possible data as quickly as possible at the most fine grain level as possible was super, super fantastic. And I have a whole bunch of other uh, specific modifications. So I'm going to kind of nerd out here a little bit more, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so one, one of the most important kind of challenges that we had early on was that the standard version of Districtor only had the ability to draw new ward maps at the precinct level. And so just as an example, I got a loop, uh, you know, set of precincts here. Uh, obviously this was drawn 10 years ago and the, the loop was much, much less uh, heavily populated than it was now. And so that entire area that encompasses all of Millennium Park, a whole huge chunk of Grand Park, obviously there's no uh, people there, but then a whole bunch of these blocks in the middle of the loop were all part of one uh, precinct. And so when we were drawing, with that software, we can say either we put that entire weird polygon in a specific ward, or we don't. It's all or nothing. We couldn't do anything at that level, and that really clashed with the testimonies that we were receiving from the individuals that were coming in and telling us about their community. When they're telling us about our, their community, they're not saying, oh yeah, you know, Ward 42, Precinct 3, or whatever the heck this is, that's, that's my home. That's how I define myself in my community. They're like, oh yeah, you know, everything, uh, you know, east of Kedzie, everything north of Lake, whatever have you, that's uh, my community. And we weren't able to draw the discrete communities the way that people had wanted us to. And so one of the, the biggest change that we made was using a different set of data to actually do this at the block level. So we were able to use census blocks rather than election precincts to draw these ward maps, which made a gigantic difference in terms of more accurately representing what people wanted. And the, the fact that everybody has a incredibly, incredibly powerful computer in their pocket nowadays means that we can have these fully functional applications just delivered through the web to your phone if you want to use it that way, easier on a computer, but also totally possible, was absolutely fantastic and uh, amazing part of, part of that. So get, having a higher granularity data probably took the most effort to bring in the data, clean it the right way, and upload it to Mapbox and have it ready, but that was something that we were able to uh, to do. We were also able to use you know, standard modern uh, software engineering processes to rapidly update that data. So on August 12th, the Census Bureau uh, uploaded their new version of the redistricting uh, data set. So that was the block level population and uh, demographic counts for every single block in the United States uh, with the help of Joey Chen from the University of Michigan, who was being retained as, the, as a professor of political science there. Uh, he was able to translate the FTP data into something that I could use to upload to, to our site. And so later on August 12th, we were already drawing our maps with this new uh, data. I, I think there was some point in September or even October when some members of city council were saying, oh, well, we don't have the latest data yet. We can't show you our map. We aren't able to do this yet. We were doing a later that same thing with, uh, with that data. So uh, whatever it is they're, they're trying to sell you, uh, sometimes you want to ask, ask twice whether that's actually looking. So a few other quality of life changes that were informed by being a member of this, uh, this commission is that we had some overlays. Let me see, there's our overlay. Uh, so in our ward map, uh, one thing that we added was the ability to uh, see police districts, which is now incredibly important because we're going to be electing uh, ECPS e representatives, three from each of these different uh, police districts. So we've got uh, police districts and sectors. We've got our grammar school boundaries in here. So if that's what defines your community, it's very easy to see that uh, as an overlay. And everybody loves their uh, community areas. We kind of can't get away from, from those. Uh, they probably cause 
less harm than good. Uh, but yeah, those are also very popular ways to uh, take a look at this. So that was a Chicago specific, very important and relevant uh, piece of information that was super helpful uh, here in Chicago. Uh, when you're drawing a map for say, I don't know, uh, Iowa, how many congressional districts in Iowa have? Three, four, something like that. You're only gonna have three or four different colors. And it'll be very easy to say, oh, that's the blue, that's the yellow, that's the red, that's the uh, purple, whatever have you. But in Chicago, when we're drawing 50 different districts, if I've got this blue, and I've got this blue, and I've got this blue, and I'm trying to edit these things, it becomes really, really difficult to figure out, okay, which of these 50 colors is this blue? Uh, and so we added this cool little eyedropper tool where we just say, oh, I want that blue, and I would immediately kick out. So this is something, this is like, 30 lines of code, something like that. But it was a specific pain point that we actively saw and I was able to, while working on this uh, redistricting process, just add, uh, add that feature. Likewise, I think the one other one uh, I wanted to add in here was the population limits. So uh, you need to make sure that the largest ward and the smallest ward are different by no more than 10%. So you have a 5% plus or minus on the population of a given ward. And so as you can see here, this first ward, this hypothetical first ward I just drew here, uh, the, the number here is black instead of red, because that one is within the tolerance that you have. And so when you're drawing these things, if you want to actually say, oh, I am sufficiently large, I am sufficiently small for this to be an acceptable size, the very quick, easy hint that we have. And so that was something that I think I added. So adding that additional feature was something that I was able to do while we were actively mapping one afternoon. And it was it was literally one line of code. I added you know, just a handful of extra stuff to say, oh, make it red if a specific uh, constraint is not met. And so I made that change, I pushed that change to my code repository, and all of those free services I talked about earlier did their magic, and I said, oh, hey, if you refresh the page, you'll see what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Uh, this is a testament to the, uh, you know, the good design of this free software that the MGGG group has, has made. It's a testament to these premium services. I think I'm talking over my takeaway slide. Uh, yeah, so at the end of the day, there's a huge amount of free software that's just there for the taking. For a lot of people that want to bootstrap some idea, you're almost always going to be able to take a good idea, turn it into something that kind of sort of works uh, with zero dollars out of your pocket, just time and knowing what's there. And a lot of that, yes, it's coming from the fact that billions of dollars are being given to venture capitalists to uh, build the amazing technical things that they're going to want to make a bunch of money on. But while they're doing it, as long as it's there, we might as well use it to the best of our ability. Likewise, and even more importantly, those uh, pieces of software are just immensely important. There's just so much open source software that our modern world requires. Uh, and sometimes it's something fantastic and you know, maybe focused and optional like this, but you know, there's thousands and thousands of pieces of software that were written for free by somebody that really wanted to do it uh, that are underneath the tools that you're using every single day. So those are just really, really fantastic opportunities for us to take advantage of. Uh, yeah, making sure that we're driving these solutions based on what's actively happening instead of building first and then hoping that that's the right solution is, you know, in my idea, the best way to go about it. And also just me as a computer scientist coming into this space and trying to uh, make the most of it. Uh, engaging first as a neighbor, as a volunteer, uh, as a community member is the right way to go rather than uh, letting the, uh, my skills drive what I end up doing. There's almost always going to be something that fits your, your skill set, but if you understand the problem first, then you figure out how to apply your skill set, that's, uh, that's the right way to go, in my estimation. So that's, uh, that's when I did this last year. It was a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot more of uh, stories that I'm more than happy to tell, but at this point, I'm super uh, appreciative of your attention and happy to take any questions.